All right, Gary Breen is with us. Uh, Gary, good morning to you. I was just saying there that um, the one of the big winners in this whole thing is uh, the uh, World Cup team from 2002 because your nostalgia suddenly becomes this mm -hmm. absolutely amazing thing that we're never going to get to experience again. Uh, morning, lads. Yeah, it is frustration because, you know, the feeling this morning is more just real gut-wrenching, the fact that we haven't got there. We expected so much and it just couldn't have gone any worse. And you're right, we look back on that and it's far too long for us to to not be a World Cup is just such a difficult thing to take in. But unfortunately, we in the end, we literally got what we deserved. Yeah, talk to us a bit about why you think last night happened. We had Kenny on a little bit earlier on, and he said that from the moment that he saw the team was lining up in the diamond formation, he really had a bad feeling about it because that wasn't something that the players looked comfortable in. The problem with the diamond formation, and, and what I found difficult to understand that he went with that last night, is that Denmark had identified exposing us in the wide areas with fullbacks. So when you play a diamond, you're looking to secure that middle area to get an overload in there, but you are weak in then wide areas. And it just seemed to compound the matter that he went with a diamond, knowing that the fullbacks of Denmark were bombing all the time. We've seen their centre-halves stepping in and hitting them diags. It causes problems in Copenhagen in terms of the double save that Randolph made. So when you then saw that selection, especially with Milan not in, in the base of it as well, you're just thinking it, it didn't make any sense. And I think Martin O'Neill obviously is going to take a lot of um, stick over the next coming days in terms of explaining his tactics. But that's part of the course of being an island manager, being an island player. It's a great honour, but it's a huge responsibility. And you have to say that the supporters will feel as if they've been badly let down. OK, so if we hadn't played a diamond last night, would the result have been materially different? Yeah, I, I think I think without a doubt it would have been. I, th I think the fact it went to 5-1 is, is a case of us trying to, to chase the game. The substitutions seem to m make absolutely no sense why you would take off your two holding midfielders you, as if you can't get in the game just because you've got people who give you that protection. They just give you a platform then to go on and play. I didn't understand that. I couldn't, for the life of me, understand why he took Clark off to put Ward at centre-back. I didn't understand what that gave you. What is Stephen going to give you at centre-half that, that Kieran can't? And it, 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 there, it was just so many things like that where you're watching the game and you're looking at an initial team selection. You're thinking, OK, let's just hope that James McLean can have an influence in and around their centre-halves harassing them, busying them, but he didn't. And then you're seeing the, the tactical substitutions after that and you're thinking, this doesn't add up. And I think that's why you probably saw the, the frustration of the supporters. You will back the team, the management all the way. But when you're seeing those type of decisions being made, it's very difficult. Just a quick one on the corner, Gary. That was obviously the turning point. Christie, will, it'll go down in history as just an error from Christie. But Ireland should have done better to clear that, shouldn't they? Listen, this has been a problem throughout Martin O'Neill's reign, um, set pieces against. And I alluded to it in the build-up to the first game, saying, listen, let's not have this tie settled on a lack of organisation from a set piece from a corner. And lo and behold, it happens that way. And people will say, well, listen, it went on to go 5-1. That was a key moment. When we're 1-0 up, they would have panicked, I'm sure of it. The crowd would have got behind us. It would have been very difficult because they would have known how difficult it is to break us down. As soon as that goal was scored, everything changed. And the organisation was ridiculous. People talk about Hendricks not going out there to make a 2v2 out on the short corner. But the guy who scored the goal, he's on his own on the edge of the box prior to that ball even being kicked. We're overloaded. We have one man marking two on the edge of the box. And I'm looking at that situation thinking, how can that possibly be so? And people might say, listen, it's the players not executing it. Well, if they don't execute it, that's a, a, that's a result of you not doing it enough on the training field. It's as simple as that. And that was the frustration for me. And I'd seen it throughout the campaign. We've seen it against Scotland in the previous one. We've seen it against Austria punishers. But not even just those goals. We have been so vulnerable at set pieces and notably corners. Bearing in mind, we've got dominant people like Clark, Duffy. Any team that plays a short corner was always going to pause us problems and it proved that way. Do you think it pours a bit more oxygen into Craig Bellamy's words that Martin O'Neill just doesn't practice set pieces and now it's uh, ended up costing us? Well, listen, you don't even have to talk to Craig. Talk to Richard Dunn, mm -hmm. who would have worked with him at Aston Villa. He gets big, strong men to defend crosses, and they're very good at it. He's done it throughout his career, be it at Leicester with the likes of Taggart, Elliot, those type of guys. Then he goes to Celtic with Balbo Baldo, Mialbi, those guys. And he's doing it now with Duffy with the Irish team. The problem is, if you don't put the ball in the box and you have to give those players a decision to make, then you're in trouble. They were never going to float balls in the box knowing how dominant Duffy is. They're always going to play it short. And for us to be caught out like that, that that's not acceptable at this level. So we're putting that 
slew of evidence together about the lack of practice and and it's evidence based over the the course of two campaigns put that together with what Kenny was saying about the, the players on the pitch getting very narky with each other because they didn't mm -hmm. really understand their own roles within that diamond because effectively he was making the point they haven't done that often enough they haven't honed that practice to a point where it's second nature to them they're all a bit like oh, that was your responsibility it doesn't really seem like it seems like that's Martin O'Neill's responsibility and he has to take responsibility for that. It is Martin O'Neill's responsibility. It's the manager's responsibility, whoever that is, for whatever team, whatever country, whatever club team it is. And you're quite right. I think in terms of being exposed in the diamond, Olsen did it to us in the Euros in the second half where James McCarthy's lack of fitness going into the tournament was exposed. He couldn't get out there quick enough. I think Kolarov did it to us as well, where John Waters, who puts an unbelievable shift. There's not many players as, as good as him, but he's a forward player. He don't stay with a runner. They score. And you're just looking at it and thinking, I'm, I've no doubt that the Denmark management team have looked at that and said, listen, there's a vulnerability about this Irish team. Yes, we're strong centrally because we pack it in sheer numbers. It's not a case of we've got incredible defenders. We just load the area and make ourselves difficult to beat. And you're right. To have that type of system, you've got to work on it. There's got to be release um passes where suddenly the ball goes to a certain position boy boys release themselves from from their disciplined defensive structure and then go and engage kenny talked about going and putting a bit more pressure on their center halves and, and i agree with him and people say well listen you have to play two up front. you don't have to do that you just play that five in midfield and one guy will know when he goes and they'll adjust behind him the rest of them but i think you're right i i, I think it is it is a well i know it's right it's the responsibility of the manager and the coaching team and people can argue that when you go along with the international team, you don't get enough time to work on it. You do. Maybe you don't have to put the work on in the training field, but you can certainly do it on the video analysis. You can do it all that type of way. And you're right. I think that the players did turn a little bit on each other. And that really surprised me because we talked about a great team ethic. I'd identified it under Martin O'Neill that they, there's a real togetherness with that group. But when it went wrong, a lot of those players started digging each other out and I wasn't comfortable seeing it. Yeah, that's kind of the most worrying thing about this. It, it, like, it looks like a, a two-year deal is on the card slash has been agreed in principle. Um, so O'Neill's not going to change now. What changes Irish football culture over the next while? Do the players need to kind of say, the senior players in that group say, look, we need to work on these things a little bit more and we need a more open sense of communication about who's going to be starting, what formation we're going to be using. You know, because traditionally we hear those stories that O'Neill would walk into the Aston Villa changing room and, and name the team and and there would be three centre backs and they'd be like, Are you playing right back or what's the story? And he's like, go and work it out. Work yeah, it out if, yourselves. Jeff, if you talk to any of the guys who've worked under Martin O'Neill, and I, I do it quite a lot because those guys from the Celtic days and he, and also Leicester days, they talk about him in, with such great respect. And I say, Okay, well listen, tell me tell me what he's actually good at then turn. What's his skill set? Because as a as a, a student of football, I want to know why he's producing and, and why he's been successful. And everyone would tell you that the key things about him is his motivation. And I've said this so many times, you don't need to motivate these players to play for Ireland. They're, they're living their dream. There's no motivation needed there. But what I've identified, what Martin is very good at, is his recruitment in terms of getting experienced players, problem solvers, who can sort out problems on the pitch. He's not able to do that with Ireland because he can only pick from the pool of players that he has. So it's not a case of him going out and, and fixing it that way in the transfer market. But going forward, are you there's no way in the world those players are going to go up to Martin O'Neill and say, listen, we want to do it this way. He's not going to accept that. He's too dominant. He's too strong. And and that's his right as a manager. He's not going to allow, allow players to come up and tell him how he wants to play. And it, you're right. I don't think Martin will change. But I would agree with what Kenny said. These players, people talk about him not having a massive pool of talent to choose. But these players are capable of so much more than they've produced throughout his reign. Not just the fact that they got beaten so heavily last night, but even in, throughout the campaign, when you're looking about looking after the ball, we're talking about Harry Arta. Every time he got it, his remit and playing that holding midfield role, certainly in the first game, was obviously a defensive responsibility that is not natural to him. But every time he got the ball, he just shelled it. He didn't pass, didn't look to play it at all. And this is this guy is unrecognisable when you see the guy who controls the ball, the tempo at Bournemouth. He's normally so accomplished on the ball. And that, that, that has to come from the coaching. The eternal optimist might say that last night would be such a wake-up call that things will have to change, but from what you're saying there, some sort of revolution in Martin O'Neill's thinking just isn't going to happen. No, listen, I think Martin O'Neill has a, a way that's been successful for him throughout his career. I don't think he's going to change. I, I, I think managers will 
evolve as such in terms of what's happening as as, as football um, develops and changes systems and what have you. But I'm not convinced that he's going to change. And he'll argue like he did last night in a press conference. He doesn't like anyone questioning him. He'll argue that his record is very strong. But you're right. I had one of your um, the guys, one of his, um, the callers coming in and saying about Martin O'Neill takes the praise when we win, but doesn't want to take it when we lose. Well, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, I mean, Kenny felt relatively optimistic at the end of our chat there. Uh, chatting to you now, I'm absolutely devastated about the future of Irish football here. Like, what the hell no, happens? I, I, no, I don't mean it in terms of... You asked me the question, will he change? I don't think he will. But if you're talking about future of Irish football, then we need to understand what he's done behind the scenes then, not just on the football pitch in terms of the first team. What has he done to improve the infrastructure as a man who's so successful as a manager, our two most famous footballing sons at the head of our coaching in Ireland. So what have you done behind the scenes? Michael O'Neill at Northern Ireland's done an awful lot. It'd be interesting to see how much Martin has done. All right, I didn't realise that about Michael O'Neill. That is interesting. But let me ask you this. Do the coaches then have any responsibility or opportunity to do a good bit more? So if, if O'Neill doesn't really worry too much about what's happening in those coaching sessions could those coaching sessions just evolve naturally into okay so next time we play the diamond lads this is exactly what everybody has to do and next time we can see the corner this is the role of everybody like can you fix that can the coaches fix that well that that feels as if like you know we're the horse is bolted now what, what are we talking about we haven't done that it's, it's incredible to think that we haven't done that in a game of that magnitude that you would have nailed down set pieces, as you rightly said, yeah, that corner. How could it be such a delay that Hendricks takes that long to go out? But initially, how can McLean have two people on the edge of the box? We're setting it up where we've got actually got three spare men. We've got Christie on the back post. We've got Myler on the six-yard box. And we've got Hendricks in around the near post. You can't have three spare men in them situations. It's basic. You're going to be overloaded. And, and, and that is the concern that when you're setting up these set pieces, and in my um, infant coaching career, I'd have had that responsibility. You've got to work out what suits you and then you've got to work out how the opposition will expose that. Now, I know that we look at our team and think, well, listen, put the ball in the box. Duffy's so dominant. That's brilliant. But then you've got to think, OK, the opposition are going to recognise that and what are they going to do to try and expose us? They're going to play it short. So then you coach the lads to say, listen, this is what they're going to do. This is how you react and this is how we adjust. I didn't see any of that. That's very worrying, really. Uh, Miguel Delaney was making the point in, on Twitter last night, and I think in, in a piece in The Independent today, about the fact that um, this argument is out there at the moment, we don't have the players, and he says it's no. really irritating, even allowing for the fact Irish football does need a massive reform. Most of international football is actually quite bad. Any half-organised team does well. Any team with modern ideas does better. I like Miguel Delaney in terms of his, his articles. I like reading his stuff, but he's spot on, but I don't think it's a genius to work out. Don't, don't, don't keep telling us we haven't got the players. We have got the players. They can do so much more than what they have done. And everyone will turn around. And anyone who's not really um, an Ireland supporter, but is just watching it from afar, and I speak to the likes of Chris Sutton, John Arts and them Celtic days, they look at this Ireland squad and think, well, listen, they're not as good as your team in 2002 or that time. So what Martin O'Neill's done is incredible. I, 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 and I always have this argument with them all the time. They could do so much more. People keep talking about, we don't have players who play in the Premier League. If you put our starting 11 out, the majority of them are Premier League players. So that argument is redundant. These players are capable of so much more than what we have seen. And Martin, o I'm sorry, and Martin O'Neill's flippant comment that we don't have a Robbie Keane and stuff like that. Well, I'd argue if we did have a Robbie Keane, do you think he would be out of score in the way we set that team up? I, I wouldn't be too sure. Yeah, it's almost like uh, the harking back to another era. I mean, maybe if we did Damien Duff, things would change. That might be one of those players where you could actually point to somebody as an individual who would be able to transform how the team plays but there's no one else really who you can kind of shoehorn into that team and say oh we're one player short here it does seem like it's a systems failure and maybe a failure of ambition well i don't i, I don't think there there's any lack of ambition i think they're desperate to do well i'd never i'd never query the management in terms of that or the players in terms of their desire ambition but these players play. can yeah, but these these players are capable of so much more. I don't care what... Harry Arter is, is the biggest point of concern for me. This is a guy who... You give the responsibility to play holding midfield, and I can understand what he's done. He's seen the remit, and he's just took it to the extreme in terms of, like, just get it, clear it, and we'll defend. But if you watch him playing for Bournemouth, this is a guy who kept Jack Wilshire out of the team last season for Bournemouth. Everyone's talking in England now. He's the, he's the, 
the saving grace for their midfield, but he couldn't even get a game ahead of Arta. And Arta, but the difference is Arta's coached day in, day out in terms of taking the ball in tight situations and having and knowing where his teammates are going to step in, make angles, make passes. And it's an organised team. And when you watch him playing for Ireland, he looks up, he doesn't see nothing, so he absolutely just boots it away. And that's the problem. We look at players and you think, well, listen, these are guys who are doing so well in the Premier League. Why are we not able to get them to do that for us? Because of the way we play? No, I'm not having it. I just think that it's not, it's not a, a valid argument to say we don't have the players. Do you think Martin O'Neill should be given another term to continue with what we're doing at the moment? I, this, this, and this is a difficult one. That's not for me to make. I think the dust needs to settle. I think people need to like take the emotion out, out of it, which is a, is a silly thing to say because it is an emotional thing. But certainly let the dust settle for a, a few weeks but then review what he's actually done throughout this campaign. Now, everyone will look at the fact that we got to Euros, which is a brilliant achievement, but we finished third in our group to get there. So that is, I'm not taking anything away from him, but it, it, we did finish third in the group. You've got to look at how this campaign's gone in terms of we've got to this stage. I mean, that iconic game to win away in Wales was, was a brilliant achievement. It was fantastic. They'll live in the memories. The only problem is it's meant nothing in the end. That's the frustration. But I think, as I alluded to earlier, we have to look at what has been gone on behind the scenes, not just on the pitch. Obviously, ultimately, you are judged on that. But you have to. we have to know what is he doing, what infrastructure is he putting in place, bearing in mind how successful he's been as a manager in terms of bringing the next group of players through and even younger ones than that in terms of putting an infrastructure in place for all the coaching network for us Irish team to produce players that we know we can do. Gary, great stuff. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. It's uh, Gary Breen. Very strong there. Very uh, thought-provoking.